In this video, we consider a similar boundary value problem, but with different boundary conditions to what we looked at in class. We will look at mixed boundary conditions. Find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for this problem and consider what a best approximation of a function looks like using the eigenvectors of the associated linear operator. The problem we consider is given here. Note that it is very similar to what we discussed in class, with the boundary conditions being changed from Dirichlet to mixed. So now the derivative of the solution is considered zero at x equals l instead of the solution itself. As before, this can be written as a linear operator equation. It looks exactly the same, the difference being in the domain of the new linear operator lm, which incorporates these different boundary conditions. Note that the LD operator from class and the LM operator given here are in fact different operators since their domains are different. We can show very similarly to what was done in class that LM is both symmetric and positive definite. And recall that this tells us that the eigenfunctions of LM are orthogonal to each other and that all the eigenvalues of LM will be strictly positive. So LM, in fact, has all the same basic properties that LD has from class. To find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we want to solve this differential equation for both u and lambda. As we've done in class, we will assume that t is equal to 1. Once the eigenvalues are found with t equal to 1, we can simply multiply them by t for any general value of t. Also, since we know the eigenvalues lambda are positive, we are going to write lambda as theta squared, the same as what was done in class. Now we can write down the differential equation that we have to solve in order to find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And this differential equation is given right here. Since only the boundary conditions have changed, not the differential equation itself, then the general solution of this differential equation will stay the same. Again, it's going to be a constant times sine of theta x plus a constant times cosine of theta x. And now we are going to use the different boundary conditions to figure out what c1 and c2 are, as well as theta. So the different boundary conditions are going to give us, hopefully, different values for theta and different eigenvalues. Using the first boundary condition, u of 0 is equal to 0, we see that c2 is going to have to be 0, just as it was before. Next, to use the other boundary condition, we have to take the derivative of our general solution u, given here. We take that derivative, evaluate it at l, and we see that we get c1 theta times cosine of theta l must be equal to 0. Since both c1 and theta we know are not equal to zero, we must have that the cosine factor is equal to zero. And this implies that theta times l, the argument to cosine, has to equal some odd integer times pi divided by two, because cosine is equal to zero at values like pi over two, three pi over two, five pi over two, seven pi over two. And dividing through by l, we see that theta will be 2n minus 1, some odd integer, times pi, divided by 2l. Now we have the following eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. Once again, we see that we have one eigenpair for every natural number. All right, and here we have a plot of the first three eigenfunctions. Note that at the right boundary, x equals l, the functions are no longer zero. Um, however, we do see that they are flat. This corresponds to the derivative being zero over here at the right boundary. However, the function itself is zero at the left boundary at x equals zero. So these three functions correspond to the new mixed boundary conditions. As before, we can find the best approximation to any function f of x using the new eigenfunctions of the linear operator Lm. The coefficients of this best approximation are determined in the same way, by taking the inner product of f with each eigenvector. 
And so we see that the best approximation Fn will be a linear combination of all of the eigenfunctions, this sine of 2n minus 1 pi x over 2l, and each of these coefficients are determined by an inner product of f with each eigenfunction. Finally, we have uh, what happens as n gets bigger and bigger and goes off to infinity. We get the following representation of the function f as a linear combination of the eigenfunctions. And this representation is called the Fourier quarter wave sine series of f. This is equal to f in the mean square sense, just as the Fourier sine series was equal to f in the mean square sense that we talked about in class. So essentially what we have now is a different way of representing any continuous function using sine type functions. But note that these are different sine functions from the ones that we discussed in class when talking about the Fourier sine series.